Good afternoon. My name is Wendy Richardson. I'm one of the volunteers here at the Michigan Military Technical and Historical Society. We are an all-volunteer museum um, that is supported uh, by memberships, donations, and special events such as this. If you're interested in becoming a member, we do have uh, forms out in the, in the lobby. Uh, one of the things I want to mention is that in addition to our, our, our winter lecture series that you are in right now, we do have a couple other ones coming up, Detroit and World War I, which is on March 6th. On April 3rd, we have Japanese balloon bombs. And April 23rd, we're going to have a very special event. Um, it is Fashion Through the Decades. Um, and so we're going to have not only fashion and the automobile, but we're also going to have some reenactors there. So it is going to be a, a little different of, a, of an event for us. Tickets are $15 and can be purchased um, at the main cash register. Our last event is something that we're very excited about. On May 15th, we're having a military Dodges presentation and book signing by David Doyle. Um, and so, um, with that, I want to introduce our speaker for today. Um, uh, Phil Nod is uh, not only a local historian, but he is our go-to person for uh, field kitchens um, for all of our reenactor events. Um, so this is not just something that uh, he reads about, he actually prepares meals um, during our reenactments, and we also had a conference uh, recently, and it, that was the meal to everyone's delight. And so I know that you are going to enjoy this presentation, and so I give you fill in. Okay. Um, the title is basically Operational Rations of the 20th Century. I'm going to bleed off a little bit with more recent editions. I am more familiar with the earlier rations, the World War I, World War II, and Korean War era. It's only been the last year or so that I've started to study more of what was issued during the 60s, uh, the 70s, 80s. I was in the Navy in the 80s, so I never ate operational rations. I, I lived on an aircraft here. I got real food. Sorry. Um, but a lot of the things that, that the Army is using now, uh, the lineage of, of the development of these things actually really dates to the subsistence research laboratory in Chicago just prior to World War II. And you'd be amazed um, at how many things that you're eating, at buying off the grocery store shelf, they were developed for the Army starting just prior to World War II. And uh, a woman came up with a book recently, it's called Combat Ready Kitchen. And it goes into more detail of what the Army did at the, the NATAC laboratories um, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, up to now, um, how they work with manufacturers uh, for two different reasons. One is they have the know-how for the packaging and the processing and all that. They help develop things with NATEC for the Army, and it's, the Army says it's public domain. You can use this, you can make it for the civilian market, make money on it, we don't care. Why do you think the Army does that? If we go to a big war again, like World War II, they already know who can make the stuff, put them online, they got rations. They don't have to worry about it. They already know who can do them. But, let's start it off here. No army marches far without the cook. Again, there he's another one of the, our cooks. As far as we know, this was the uh, distinguished unit uh, lapel badge worn by the cadres at the bakers and cook schools in each of the core areas of World War II. Um, I have yet to verify that with the Quartermaster Museum. Uh, you dish it up, we'll dish it out. The best fed soldier in the world. Uh, we always are uh, in the United States Army. Even during the Revolution, our guys fighting the British were being fed better than the British. The Civil War, we had the highest calorie intake for soldiers. Um, you always hear soldiers griping about army food. Well, when the army started developing their own menus and cooking manuals in the 1880s, all they did is they went and they researched where the guys came from. A lot of them were from the south, so you had a lot of southern recipes, but also New England and things like that. They just took home recipes. That's all they are. Army recipes aren't army recipes. They're home recipes that are just developed, you know, here. Make this for 100 people instead of six. 
Now we're going to um, World War One, um, and I actually have uh, items from the different periods: uh, World War One, World War Two, uh, Korean War, 1950s, 1960s, uh, 1980s, up through more recent times. I don't have an item of everything, but I have some samples. Uh, a lot of the World War II things are reproduction. They're just, for some reason, people want crazy money for them. But in prior to World War I, they developed what they called the reserve ration, which was carried in a pack. For one day, you'd have two boxes, eight ounce boxes of hard bread. And when we went to France, they had a change from a cardboard box to a metal tin. Can anyone guess why they went to a metal tin? <clears throat> no, gas warfare. The gas wouldn't penetrate the tins. So you got two of these a day, and this is what the crackers look like. Now, anyone remembers Nabisco, you need a biscuit, which they stopped making about 10 years ago? You need a, or Nabisco was one of the major manufacturers of this cracker. Basically, if you ate a you need a biscuit, you ate a World War I hardtack. Uh, you also got one 12 ounce can of corned beef or a 12 ounce can of salmon. They called it goldfish and monkey meat. <laughs> now, the other uh, operational ration that they were issued uh, was called the emergency ration, also known as the armor ration. It was developed by an armor packing company. Um, these could only be opened. Uh, with permission of an officer or an extreme emergency, like you're completely cut off. Uh, it had three compressed, basically pemmican, ground meat, dried meat discs, and three chocolate discs. Uh, they weren't tasty, um, they weren't meant to be, but it would keep you alive. Um, these got over late during the war. Uh, there was a large surplus of them. Nobody knows what happened to a lot of these. This is one of the rarest things that you can find for um, army rations for the 20th century. For some reason, they're just, they're not around in, in large numbers, even though a lot of them were not used. But this item uh, comes up again as we look at how the army was developing rations for World War II, this emergency ration. Uh, this is the standard field kitchen in Europe for the US Army. We basically adopted the European style um, slum wagon. Uh, it had a firebox, wood-burning uh, stove in there, and basically it was just for making stews and coffee. Uh, they get canned corn beef, the bigger cans, uh, canned stew, things like that, make stews and soups and coffee. Um, domestically, they use the field range number one, field range number two, which is basically uh, just sheet metal stoves that you dug a trench, started a fire in this trench, and you built the stove up around it. Um, we got rid of those after World War I. For some reason, we went back to using the field range number one and field range number two. Now, this is the first item that the subsistence research laboratory began working on in the 1930s. Uh, as Captain Logan initially ended up becoming a colonel in the Quartermaster Corps, he developed this ration. This is an emergency one. You get three of these a day. They're 400 to 600 calories a piece. So it's basically a large four ounce chocolate bar. But it's not just chocolate. There's um, extra sugar in there, milk powder, cocoa fat, flour, vanilla, and uh, thiamine. So there's some vitamins that help keep you going. Uh, it was originally called the Logan Bar. But the Army went from the old garrison ration, reserve ration naming system to the garrison ration and then the field ration. Field rationing in World War II had the A ration, which was basically what you got in the garrison ration. Same thing, all fresh foods. Okay. Um, the difference being in garrison ration is you actually bought the food. You were allotted so much money a month, it's or so much money per person, and you had X amount of guys. You could buy that many things that were on the standard menus. You bought it from the commissary, basically and you had to account for the money. When the war broke out, they dropped that and this went straight to the field ration system. So the A ration was basically the garrison ration, except you didn't have to do any accounting 
the mess sergeants didn't have to mess with the books anymore. They liked that. Um, and they went to what they call the A ration. Again, it's the garrison ration. It's all fresh foods. They went to the B ration, which was canned or dehydrated foods. They went to the C ration, and then the D, and then eventually they came out with the K ration. And then they had some other special group rations, which we'll be looking at. Um, the C and C ration, by the way, does not mean canned ration. It means it was the third type of field ration, A, B, C. And this is the D bar, D ration. Uh, <clears throat> this is the uh, C ration crate. Um, how many Vietnam vets are here? Okay, did you guys eat C rations? <laughs> you did not. I bet you guys tell me that they're eating World War II C rations. Yep. I'll bet you you didn't. Did, were your cans gold? No, no. I remember they were gold. They, they weren't gold. No, all I know is the pages were worth a lot of money. Uh, this, <laughs> cans in World War II were anodized gold to prevent rust. Now, in 1944, they promulgated a new order. They wanted everything painted out of drab. Yeah. It took them until June of 44 to come up with the color that they wanted. But because all the anodized gold cans were still in process, they were still making them until the end of the war. So there's never a, a, an olive drab can made during World War II. Okay? But basically what you got is uh, 3B units, which is your bread units. One of these. This is a reproduction one. And you got 3M units, your meat units. Originally they only had three menus. Very, very boring. Dog food, dog food, and dog food. <laughs> um, baked is basically baked beans, uh, meat and vegetable stew, and meat and vegetable hash. Very, very redundant. Um, but initially, your, your B units were always the same. You got like five crackers, some hard candy, uh, three uh, cubes of sugar, and this is your coffee. This is an original sea ration coffee can. I, I took the coffee out of this. It's like I got that stored. But this was actually in the camp as a metal container. The next thing that was developed was originally developed for the paratroopers. They called it the parachute ration initially. Uh, it became standardized as the K ration. The quartermaster course said that it came up with the K because it didn't sound like a C or a D. So it didn't redundant. But it was actually developed by a uh, phys physiologist named Dr. Ansel Keys, the University of Wisconsin. And the quartermasters don't admit it, but they think they named the K ration after his, the K from his last name. Um, the calories for these rations, the C's and the K, uh, came, they average 3,600 calories a day. So you get 3M units in the C ration with 3B units, that's about 3,600 calories. They're ballpark around 1,100 calories per meal. Same with the, the K ration, which was much smaller and much lighter. Um, you got some type of a canned meat product, two different types, K1 or K2 biscuits, uh, gum, sugar. Uh, depends on which meal you got. You got uh, either coffee, uh, lemon powder, later they had orange powder, uh, even beef bullion. But there's your breakfast unit. This, unlike the, the C ration, which was just those three menus, these were actually different menus for each of the meals. Uh, this is the later type box. Um, this was called the morale box. These were rarely seen in World War II, even though they came out during the war. Uh, they made them colored so you can see them at night, see which ones you're grabbing. That was the idea behind it anyway. Uh, but again, you see the different biscuits, different size biscuits. Uh, that's pork loaf. This is actually supper, so that's your, your evening meal. Um, your keto in the can is roughly about five ounces toilet paper. Uh, you got bullion powder in this one. And here's the lunch one. The lunch one was always a can of cheese. <coughs> can craft pasteurized cheese. Chocolatos, again, two different types. This is the K1 and K2 biscuit, the sugar, matches, and the uh, cigarettes. Two cigarettes. Remember that? Here's some original Philip Morris one. And do you know why these were actually put in here in the K rations initially? It kept the stuff from sliding around in the box. You put four of these in here, it actually just slide around. But when they did that, 
They also figured, look, at these guys are out in the field. They don't have any PX rations. So initially, they were getting a, a box that they called the PX box, and it was given to guys free. Like for every 100 guys, you got so many toothbrushes, toothpaste, things like that. But what about the toilet paper? So they started putting toilet paper in the K ration. The C's didn't have that initially. In late 43, um, they started changing some of the B units. Uh, they added cocoa powder to one instead of coffee and lemon powder to another one. So you got three different beverages during the day. Um, in the different B units, two of the B units had one cigarette a piece in there. No matches, just one cigarette. The cocoa one, uh, the can that had the cocoa powder did not have a cigarette because they didn't want the tobacco smell getting into the cocoa powder. Um, but by 1944, they actually developed, uh, I have one on display here. This is an accessory packet from the C rations. So for every six cans, there's one accessory packet. This had uh, nine cigarettes, toilet paper. Um, initially, it was water purification tablets, and I think they went to the uh, salt tablets, matches, things like that. So you did get an accessory packet, but that was not until mid-1944 in the C ration. Uh, but the K's were the first to have the toilet paper and the matches and the cigarettes. So the coffee was instant coffee? Yes. Yeah. Um, when I took it out of this, this tin, it was just like a solid disc because it all just, the heat over the years just melted it together. And see, this is unopened and it's it's solid in there now after 70 some years. And this, this goes into 10 and 1 direction. Uh, this is how your K's are packed. They're, you know, the C's and K's came in wooden boxes uh, with a cardboard box on the inside. Um, this was actually uh, meals for 12 men for one day compared to the MREs, which is just 12 meals. These took up less space. It's amazing. Um, this is the 5 and 1 ration. This was copied off of the British composition ration that we came across in North Africa in 1942. They had a package that fed 14 men for one day using standard commercial canned goods. So the Army developed this 5 and 1 ration. Uh, and again, you see, it's just standard. There's some government style packaging, like the canned butter. And uh, that's the pork sausage. So if you ate like B rations in, in Vietnam, the cans are very similar. It's that government style packaging. Um, and if anyone used to go to Kroger and go to the generic aisle, you get the white packaging with the black lettering. That's the generic packaging that they did in World War II. That was a hangover from World War II. But see, a lot of these items are just Chef Boyardee, meatballs and spaghetti, right off the shelf. It fed five men for one day, three different uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They also had the mountain ration. Same thing, this was for the, uh, it was developed for the 10th Mountain Division. Um, had fruit bars, dehydrated baked beans. They started complaining about the dehydrated things, but the Army kept doing it for some reason. It kept that on weight. Um, dehydrated processed cheese, sugar, uh, pork luncheon meat. The Army never bought Spam in World War II. They bought pork luncheon meat from Armour, Treat, Prem, all those companies. They did buy Spam, but it was never packaged in Spam. It was in that generic label, pork luncheon meat. So the Army can say they never bought Spam. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. That seems like a mighty small box for all those men. Who, That's, divided, who divided it up? The five guys. Split it up. Yeah, there's there's items for breakfast, lunch, and dinner in there. Now, let's see. Whoop, whoop, whoops. The next thing that came out was the five one. Instead, it was too small. You need a bigger thing. They developed the ten in one ration. But basically, a ten in one ration was nothing but two uh, five in one rations combined. You have a first half and a second half, and I have reproductions here of those. And these are original menus from 10 and 1 rations. Um, menu number three, let's see, I, these don't correspond in here, but here's a breakfast one. You can see the menu cut out there. Uh, you have dry cereal, 
Barrington Hall coffee, this is the same thing. So one ounce can, this is Nescafe though. That's the original item. Sliced bacon, uncooked. Um, they should have the butter in there. And then you have a box of C square biscuit. It's a, one of the biscuits they developed for the C ration, but they were square. And I, again, reproduction box in here, some of these things. Oh, that's the dinner. Um, what they did now for lunch was, rather than a group ration where you have to sit together to cook it uh, in, a, in a squad stove, it's basically a K ration broken up. You got a box of the biscuit and all the items, the powder, the coffee, um, matches, things like that, and then a, a can of meat of some type. Depending on what day it was, it could be cheese, it could be something else. Uh, let's see here. This is the supper. See, they got beans. I'll read this one. You got uh, in menu number three. You had corned beef, peas, biscuits and butter, fruit bar, and orange drink. And they also well started issuing out the P38 can opener with this ration. That technically was developed by a guy in 1930 for the army, but they never really adopted it until the war came out. But in fact, that was actually developed in World War One by the French army. They were, they were longer. So it's not an American invention, the French did it. But the Army doesn't go along with that. Um, other examples are cereal, bacon, biscuits, and jam, coffee, and milk for breakfast, uh, the K ration dinner, English style meat and vegetable stew, string beans, biscuits and butter, fruit bars, and coffee. There was uh, 10 menus, or excuse me, five menus for the uh, 10 and one ration. Now, <clears throat> that's like for the field troops. That's the basic operational rations, not going into the V ration itself. Um, you have guys in the Air Corps, Air Force, Army Air Force. How do they eat? Well, initially they gave them boxes of K rations. Then they had a thermos that carried sandwiches, a thermos container, and two things of coffee. But then they came out with the food tray galley. There's one over here, except I don't have the coffee mugs and the trays. This was plugged into a building to preheat. They put the food into the trays, put them in the top one here. There's six coffee cups, this is too many. Uh, six trays and six coffee cups go in there. You pick it up, carry it into the bomber, plug it into the bomber's electrical system. There's two different cores that go to this thing. And then the top drawer would have uh, the utensils, salt, pepper, uh, paper towels. And they also, carried in the standard, this is a thermos made for the Army Air Force, uh, they'd have additional coffee in here. This got the uh, Army Air Force tags on it. But they actually had like basically the same type of a galley that was developed for the uh, civilian airliners in the 50s, except those were permanent. Now, when you're eating out in the field, you're eating either your A ration or your B ration. And remember, B rations are just canned goods or dehydrated foods. This is an original um, stew box. This contained, what was it, uh, 24, 30 ounce cans. That's a lot of cans to open up for guys, but it's canned. You don't have to refrigerate it. Okay? Now you eat your food, you got your mess kit, it's filthy, you gotta scrape it out and clean it. They developed the pre weigh immersion heater in 1943. Military used these things up until about 10 years ago. Even though they stopped using, they stopped issuing meat cans in 2002. Um, but basically you dump your garbage. This is hot soapy water, first rinse, second rinse. Um, it burns gasoline, it has a flame box, a donut at the bottom of the garbage can. It can heat 32 gallons of water in about what, five minutes to a rolling boil and you don't want to put your hands in these things. But it will sterilize your mess kit cleaner than you're gonna do it in your sink at home. But these things are absolutely freaking amazing. We came across a guy who's in the Soviet Army in the 1980s, and he's looking at our field kitchen, and he goes, you had those ranges in World War II. You had these in World War II. We never had those in the 80s in the Russian Army. <clears throat> and this is the standard M1937 field range. Your standard company, battery, or squadron 
uh, had three of these each. Um, and normally six cooks, uh, mess sergeant, uh, first and second cook, and, and three assistant cooks, and then whatever um, cooks helpers you could get. Uh, you have three positions for the burners here. This one, the burner's at the bottom, he's boiling, and he can roast. This one, the burner's up top. That's telling me he's using the square head here as a deep fryer. Uh, you can bake cakes, deep fry chicken, um, Anything you can do with your kitchen range at home, you can do with these. Uh, one quart shy of two gallons burns for four hours. This, this is the most ingenious thing that the Army has ever come up with as far as I'm concerned. Um, they're great. And it, in theory, these things were still being used up until about five, six years ago by some units. This one or the later development, they came up with another version of this stove in 1959, but they were used interchangeably pretty much all the way through the late 80s, early 90s as a standard kitchen item for the field. Okay. Uh, this is the kitchen spice pack. Um, again, this is issued out to the field kitchens. I think this came, uh, I think you got one of these a week. Um, this is your spices. Baking soda, things like that. Uh, like I said, they bake biscuits. If they had time, they bake biscuits. And the interesting thing in World War II, when we invaded Normandy, the guys carried either C or K rations for two days. Then they went to ten to one rations for thirty days. After that thirty days, they went to the B ration. They landed the field kitchens finally. Then during Operation Cobra for the breakout of the Normandy bridgehead, they went back to the ten and one rations. But as we fought across France and up through and including the Battle of the Bulge through the end of January, 80% of the army in Europe was getting the A ration. They were getting fresh meat and fresh vegetables. 80% of the army. The other 20% were those guys on the front line. Not everybody ate C and K rations in World War II their whole time in the service. Now, the K ration was discontinued in 1947. A lot of things changed in 1947. The Army Air Force became the U.S. Air Force. They dropped the C ration. That term dropped out of Army use. They dropped the K ration. They said it wasn't needed. Now, I'll get back to the K ration later. The C ration just got repackaged and under a different name. It became known as the Ration combat individual. Instead of getting your six cans just loose, you got them in a box. This is kind of roached out, but these are so hard to find, it's ridiculous. You got three B units, three M units. They had 10 different menus for the M units. Of course, they always had the beans and franks. Well, they still make them in the MREs. Uh, you got Initially, you got one 12 ounce can of fruit. That's kind of hard to split up between two meals, so they went to two six ounce cans. You got an accessory pack. Um, yeah, and that, that came in this box. That was one day's rations in this box. Ration combat individual. Now, in Korea, <coughs> for the most part, they were still getting two hot meals a day. They really, really, really tried to get everyone two hot meals, no matter what phase during the war it was. Especially in 1950 when it was very fluid, we kept going up and down Korea. They were still getting, for the most part, two hot meals a day. So they broke up these rations that was designed for one person for one day. How, how do you break up two cans of fruit with how many guys? So somebody always got short. <laughs> they didn't like it. The other interesting thing is they actually started in 1947 when they switched from the C ration to the RCI was plastic spoons. It's the first time plastic spoons were issued. Right there. Now, this small ration here uh, is actually called the assault ration, it's, or food packet assault. It's not a ration, so if you got given that, like if you went into Inchon, it didn't come out of your book. Like, they owed you money if you were given that, because it's not a ration, it was just to sustain you. You got a small can of meat, small can of uh, two biscuits and a, and a uh, cookie, you got your plastic spoon and accessory packet. Cigarettes, a small plastic bag, uh, I think it was two coffees, two sugars, matches, toilet paper, things like that. 
That was an assault ration. It was here, you got this, that's, that's all you're gonna need for the day. But it wasn't a meal, it wasn't a ration. Um, these are guys loading uh, sea rats. They still call them that. Soldiers call them that. They were not sea rations though. Everyone says sea means sea ration. It's on the Vietnam era MCI. That means commissary. Doesn't mean sea ration. But you notice there's a C3, a C4. They had C1, which was discontinued in 47. They renamed it as C1. Uh, C2, C3, C4. There was no C5, C6, C7. What they was is they, they changed some of the menus a little bit. Um, the C6, for some reason, when they, they designed what went into the C6 ration, they didn't put a plastic spoon in it. The guys in Korea were complaining because they didn't carry their mess equipment. Um, but that's them you know, showing those load, being loaded up on a truck. Um, after the Korean War, they dropped the C3, C4. They went to one standard thing. Uh, this box was packaged in 1955. And you don't see that on there anywhere. Um, there's a young Korean child opening up uh, a box clearly marked C3. The interesting thing about the C3 is all the other uh, RCIs got a paper foil accessory pack. The C3 got it in a can. It has the same things in it, but it's in a can. Rich, Rich, each of these manufactured by different uh, contractors? Oh, everybody. All kinds of makers for them. I haven't even actually looked. This, they're not even marked. Oh, FPI, I don't know who they are. I have a list of all the people that made them in World War II. I don't have any the list of the companies that were making them um, in the 50s and 60s. But here, again, this is basically the interior of one of those boxes. Uh, there's one of the fruit cans. They opened up, somebody opened up, obviously, one of the B units. Pork sausage patties, which guys hated. Uh, they said they're too fatty and there's too much gravy. Same thing with the hamburger patty. They hated the canned spaghetti because if you tried to heat it up with um, the little sterno cans, it just burnt everything. Everybody still liked the pork and beans and the beans and franks. <laughs> but you read about guys that were up in uh, the chosen reservoirs. How do you eat these things when they're frozen solid and you couldn't light a fire? Guys would try to keep them in their coats to, to thaw them out. Now, the 5 and one ration was dropped in, in late 1943 when they developed the 10 and one ration. But then after the war, they said, you know, the 10 and one ration wasn't perfect because he had that K ration launch. So they came up with the 5 and one ration again, but it was renamed the ration small detachment 5 and one Same type thing. Canned meats, canned fruits, a mixture of government packaging and civilian packaging. Uh, you also see like civilian candy bars now, rather than a government packaged candy bar. Uh, you can't really read those. These are sample menus from those. Uh, this style ration was still being used up through the 1980s, the small detachment <coughs> ration. Uh, they started complaining in Korea because initially all they had um, in Japan was large stocks of the B ration hash and beef stew. Guys went back to the field kitchens. They didn't want hash and beef stew because they could eat that out of their RCI rations. It's just repetitive. And then the other thing that they had a lot of were the five and ones. The cooks hated it because you had to open up a million small cans to feed your company. And they said, we don't like it. Don't consider it an operational ration. But it wasn't designed to be used by frontline troops in combat. It was designed for frontline troops in a static line that could use a squad stove to heat them up. Uh, here's some of your standard B item things here. You got tea bags, uh, bread. They actually, as, for, as much as possible, they tried the bread units. Um, uh, there's a fascinating article about this in the um, quartermaster operations of the Korean War, the bakeries that they set up. They, People got bread that was no less than two days old on the front lines when they got them delivered. They were a couple hundred miles back from the front, some of these bakers. Uh, but again, you'll see a mixture of some civilian and, and military packaging. Uh, B ration uh, was used pretty much right up through the early 1990s, variations thereof. And you see some of the uh, menus here. 
uh, tomato vegetable soup with crackers, baked chicken and rice, cranberry sauce, buttered green beans, sweet pickles, bread, margarine, uh, yellow cake, coffee. Uh, and the interesting thing is, um, after the pre-award, they actually started putting bread in cans. I wish this had the bread in it, but it's gone now. How did it do? Hmm? How did it do? I didn't eat that. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did. I've had crackers. I've had Korean War era crackers, and they tasted fine. I mean, this, this is the contents of a Korean War era one. Chocolate disc, which you can eat either as a candy bar or you can crumble it up in hot water and make cocoa out of it. Uh, plum jam and your five crackers. <coughs> again, the, the small detachment ration again. Now, um, we're moving on into the late 50s and the Army wanted to get away from the idea of a ration. It's just food. They wanted the idea of a meal. So what you ate in Vietnam were not C rations. They were MCIs, meal combat individual. Now initially, you got your meat unit in the standard, actually it was this one, standard 12 ounce can. Um, by the late 60s, early 70s, the MCI went to a, a smaller, like the B unit can of meat. They went to a smaller amount. It actually lowered the calorie intake a little bit. But this is what you're eating in Vietnam, were the MCIs. Now, early in the 60s, you might still be getting some of these rations. Um, but I've yet to talk to anyone who can, that was certain in Vietnam said they ate World War II rations that said they got a gold can. So you might have had the, the 1950s uh, RCIs, but not the World War II. Yes? They were all of bread cans, and they came in a box about this big, and they were called C rations. Yeah, that's yeah, a, that's an MCI. Uh, not C, I, they were called C rations because their dads ate C rations in World War II, or maybe their brothers did in Korea. They, I mean, these were called C rations when I was in the Navy, but but they're not C rations. They're in a can, but that doesn't make them a C ration. Technically, a C ration was done in 1947. I know, I get really anal about this stuff. <laughs> uh, now, this is interesting, because this is your standard stuff in the 60s, 70s, and up through the early 80s. But, this is the 1962 or 63 NATEC catalog. Milk combat individual, right? Let's see if it's in here. Early 60s, meal. Ready to eat individual. The MRE. They started developing this actually in the late 1950s. They wanted to cut down on the weight of each meal in the ration. Okay? World War II, each meal averaged 1.5 pounds. Korea, each meal in here was about 1.5 pounds. So you had, what, four and a half pounds for a, a day's ration. Okay? Same with the MCIs. It's about four and a half pounds for the day, roughly a pound and a half or so for each meal. So they want to come up with new retort packaging. Now, this was developed, uh, offshoot of this in Vietnam was the Lurk ration, dehydrated meat patties, things like that. But they were, it, was, it came out of, hey, we're already working on this new ration to replace the MCI, so why don't we use this for the reconnaissance guys? It's lighter weight in theory. Um, you see, this is all how they're proposing how to package it and things. Okay, now, this is actually the one that they started coming out with now in uh, the 1980s. The initial boxes were <coughs> kind of like this. Uh, they went through different changes in size of the packaging. The first generation of MREs, the meat patties, were all dehydrated, like the Lurk ration was. You gotta rehydrate that. How much time does it take to do that? It's not a very good concept. But they were using the retort packaging. Some of the items like the baked beans were still, you know, they weren't dehydrated. <coughs> um, but that was the first generation. Uh, they also started developing what they called the, the tea ration, the tray ration. Um, each of these would feed, I think the initial ones were 18 people. 
Uh, basically, I got to do this is dumped in boiling water for 20 minutes. And you open it up, and it's like a little steam tray, like you get in the, in the galley or, or the mess hall. And you feed guys on trays that way. Hence the, the tray pack. Um, that actually started, uh, yeah, you see them serving here. Um, field cooks really didn't have to do any cooking now with the advent of the T ration. But they were still getting B rations also, depending on what the operational necessity was. <clears throat> now, the T ration evolved into what is now known as the UGR, the unitized group ration. Uh, the UGR itself basically replaced the old style B ration, except for one thing. It uses like the standard number 10 cans, things like that. It's modularized. Each unit can feed 50 guys. The only thing is you have to add milk and fresh meat to it, or frozen meat. That's the standard UGR. Um, but again, you just a lot of things you just dump in boiling water. The assault kitchen that they have now is basically a 200 gallon water tank on wheels that you dump some of these UGRs in and heat them up. It's not a whole lot of thinking in, in the field <coughs> nowadays. Uh, the heat and serve uh, are a little, they're, it's, uh, it's a quicker form. They're smaller, uh, these, but these also uh, feed 50 people too. Um, there's no mess kits being issued. They stopped is issuing mess kits in 2002, even though the MREs came out 20 years before that. Guys still had to carry that in their rucksacks during training, but they never used them. So they finally stopped issuing those meat cans in uh, 2002. You know, you got this hot sauce there. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that came in the accessory pack. Yeah, each, awesome. each UGR has an accessory pack of hot sauce. Um, what else they have? I think it's um, uh, Worcestershire. Well, yeah, that's, no, those come with the, uh, the MRE. Uh, unitized group ration A, uh, not much difference. The UGRE goes back to the concept of the small detachment ration, like the 10 and 1 in the Korean War era small detachment ration. This feeds 18 people, but all you gotta do is open up the box, you pull a tab, close the box up, wait 20 minutes, everything in that box is now heated up. You pull it out, here's your trays of the different foods, Here's your trays to give to the guys and their, their plastic forks, spoons, cups. We are creating so much garbage <laughs> with the modern ration system. Now keep in mind, the Army went away from using gasoline stoves, the gasoline-powered squad stoves, and the gasoline lanterns, things like that, because gasoline pollutes. We are generating so much garbage at each meal now because of this, because they say that the uh, um, Immersion heaters in the meat tray, uh, meat cans, mess kits, aren't healthy. Anybody certain? You no, know, anybody ever used an immersion heater and got sick? Oh, but there's there's no garbage. You know, yeah, you get some gassing off, but you're not creating the amount of garbage. Now, supposedly, Natec is developing wrapping for the MRE and the T and the uh, UGRs and stuff that is biodegradable. Now, they're supposed to have a shelf life of between 15 months and three years at a minimum, right? Well, if they're biodegradable, <laughs> how fast before they start breaking down? It's containing food. To me, it doesn't really make too much sense. But it's fascinating technology because this retort packaging, all that, you can buy all these things in the grocery store today. Now, this is the M59 fuel range. This is a modified M37. What they did is they had problems getting the roasting pan out. You had to pull it out of the old M37. This one, it's up on top and there's a dome lid that comes over, so it's easier to operate. But just like the M37, you have a 10 gallon and a 15 gallon pot. You have, this is an M2 burner, not the World War II type, but they could use a World War II type burner. Um, you got the roasting pan or the deep fryer, but the lid of the square head is actually, you flip it over, it's a grill. You can grill fry on that. That in your backyard? <laughs> I, I, have. I have. I Who doesn't? <laughs> I mean, I'm asking if that picture was in your backyard. No, no, that one isn't. I don't have an M59. Um, 
This is the uh, mobile kitchen trailer, the MKT. These came out in the late 60s. They constantly upgraded these over the years. Like they added lighting, they added different type of uh, um, tarps on them. The old canvas went to like the vinyl type thing, fly screens. Um, these have like four burner units that you set in there, you just put, there's like a big griddle that you can use. There's usually an M59 range in there also. Uh, just depends on how it's set up. Now this is the newer version. This is called a containerized kitchen. Um, you, know, you see, there's, there's not much in here, right? There's like two tables, an aisle down the middle, right? And you have like serving lines on either side. It's not very fancy. There's your containerized kitchen now. That's the inside. These things are like, they have pull-outs, like a camper. These things are just, oh my God. And these are MBUs, modern burner units. Unlike the uh, World War II um, 37 fire unit and the M2 and the M2A that they used in Vietnam in the 80s, this uses MoGas, which is basically jet fuel. So they're nice. They're automatic start. You know, they have battery start up on them. They're fantastic. But you notice they got a real griddle. There's your steam trays, you know, but they're not steam trays. This is where you're cooking your tea rations now. It's just like a big thing of water. Aren't those the ones that use 24 volt to start? Hmm? Those are 20, 24 volt to start. Ah, I don't have one. I like my simplified burner unit. There's no nonsense about it. And by the way, the old the World War II burner unit and the M2 that they're, you know, you'd see in Vietnam in the 80s. They use both of them interchangeably. You pump them up by hand pump, bicycle pump, the 40 pounds of pressure. Or if you're really smart, in Vietnam, you took it to your deuce and a half with the air compressor and charged it up. <coughs> All right, that's for that. Now, I'm going to go through and, and go over some of these things. Um, the World War One items here, except for the I had to reproduce the label, the, the corned beef tin. These are actual, this is what you got for one day. These are original, this is reproduction. That's your reserve ration. That's what you ate for the day out in the trenches. If you do not go back to the uh, field kitchen. That is an original armor ration. It's, it's heavy. It's pretty bulky. There's a lot of calories in here. I can't remember. I think there's, it's... Do you remember, Jim, how much is chocolate? There's uh, it's chocolate and beef. It's, it's, it's pemmican, yeah. but I think there's like 900 calories in this. It'll keep you alive. It's open only right. in extreme situations. Or under uh, command of an officer. Now, there's different ways that you can heat up your rations in the field. If you're not using a field kitchen, the simplest way was using a fuel tablet. You, this is in three sections. You'd score it and break it off. One of these three squares would heat up um, one C unit. Just kick your boot into the ground, light this, put it down, put the can on top, unopened, and it would heat it up. It would also heat up a cup of coffee in your canteen cup. Everybody pretty much got, this is a 1910. It, changed design slightly even up through Vietnam they went to the plastic but it's basically the same thing you heat up your coffee in this over one of those or they just took the idea from sterno two different sizes of canned heat now these we get issued with the five and one or the ten and one rations to heat up those cans or the marines got smart and developed this in world war ii but most of them don't show up until Vietnam. It has a little hexamine disc. You put it in there, set the can on top. And then that just folds up and goes in your pocket. It's kind of a brilliant little thing. Took the idea off the German Esbit stove. Um, reproduction D bars. But that's how you, you heat it up individually by yourself. In 1941, Ernie Pyle raved about this. Coleman developed the M1941 squad stove. It's about a pint of gasoline in there. Um, this would bring 
You guys recognize those cans? This would fit in there. The, Is that the, regular gasoline? Regular gas, yeah. Uh -huh. And you can use white gas in it too. This goes over the top. You can make coffee in that. The interesting thing is, and most people weren't aware of this in the 50s and 60s even, the shape of the can was originally designed to fit the M41. It was a taller uh, squad stove. But the idea was is you put two cans of sea rations in it, fill it with water, and the water heated up the ration so it didn't burn the food like if you're doing the direct flame. <coughs> now, again, mountain troops, they developed the mountain ration. They also developed the single burner M1942, which I think is the best camping stove ever invented. And I have over 30 different gasoline <laughs> stoves, camping stoves. This thing will light up at minus two degrees as well as it does at 70 degrees. Whereas modern little butane, you know, MSR, they all use the high tech camping stoves. If it gets cold out, they don't light. It slows down the gas. This was also designed to fit into the same can but they developed the mountain cook set. Two pots and a frying pan. The M M42 will actually fit in here. That was developed for the mountain troops, but this was called the mountain cook set, and this is still being made by the Army. This is actually brand new. This was made a few years ago by SMP, State Machine Products, Reed Kentucky State Prison. Um, now, this lit up right away, you pump it up, you can light it right away. The pre-way, um, you had to bleed a little gas down into a tube, light it up, it preheated the generator. This will boil this water in, in maybe two minutes. It's that hot. There is no temperature settings. <clears throat> so that's why you always want to heat it up a can of, of uh, your M unit. Go ahead. Oh, no. uh, another nickname for that stove is the Aladdin. The Aladdin, yeah. Ernie Pyle raves about it. He, he loved his. He got one off a guy in North Africa. They, what they did is Preway, Prentice Waivers, worked with Coleman uh, and a couple of other companies, American Gas Machine um, and another, I think, I think it was Aladdin. Uh, and they developed the M1950, which was issued up through about 10 years ago. It's the same shape as the 42, but it has the lighting system from the Coleman design. Um, and like I said, they got rid of these. They, they don't use anything that burns gasoline anymore. But that's how your squad, it, the idea was is one of these was issued to each squad or a squad sized unit if you're out in the field. That way you can heat up the small detachment rations, you know, your, you can heat up your C rations, since everyone calls them C rations. Um, but they're just brilliant. I mean, this, like I said, I, I go camping, I still carry this, and I have some Coleman two burners and things like that. This thing never fails. Uh, it's 70 something years old, and it's absolutely perfect. Um, now, we got over to plug into the MREs. First generation MRE package is a little different. Uh, the box is even different. It was a flat box, much like the MCI. It was brown wrappers. And you can see over the years, the packaging keeps changing. Now I want to go over something about the idea is they want to develop a ration that was lighter, right? Because cans are heavy, right? Cans are bulky, right? <coughs> Those two cans have the same amount of calories as this box, right? It has the same amount of calories as this. This is supposed to be lighter and less bulky than the World War II things. This weighs about 1.5 pounds. Just like that. This actually weighed under a pound. And uh, who remembers their fuel jackets from the Army? You know your big square pocket? You know why it's that shape? It's designed for the K ration box. And they kept that design until they dropped the M67, M65 jacket a few years ago. They kept that, that pocket design. But look at the difference. And this is supposed to be higher tech. And look at how much garbage this produces as opposed to an inner box and outer box. And by the way, just like this, your inner box here was your toilet. If you're in a foxhole. It's a waxed 
wax impregnated inner box. You use it for your toilet in the foxhole, or you can light it and heat up a cup of coffee. Now, some of the other things too is like you got your B ration, your A ration being cooked on your field kitchen, right? You got to bring them up to the front lines. In World War II, oh boy, pardon me. This wastes of time. This is what you got. This is your original Marmite can. This is the M1941. <coughs> this will keep food hot for hours. Um, come on. They have different types of inserts. Um, this would feed 25 men. What you could fit in this. You had three of these inserts in there. Uh, they had half moon inserts and triangular inserts also. Uh, but this would be brought up at night on the company Jeep, like in World War II, and the guys would be fed their meal that way. And they'd have like their C ration or K ration during the day. Because obviously you're not driving around on the front lines. You know, Germans shooting at you. You know, so you, they try to do a trip in the morning when it's dark and a trip in the evening when it was dark. Then they grab the guys' mess kits, bring them back to the kitchens, and the next morning they bring them out cleaned. So the cooks had to clean everybody's meat can if they were on the front line of World War II. Yeah, and they're a couple of miles back. Uh, now, the problem is, you see me trying to lift this thing, and that's empty. That's heavy. All right. So in 1944, they developed the M1944, which is the original name for this. However, these were never issued until 1947. <laughs> but it's a World War II design. This was used until about 10 years ago. They now have a flat plastic one. But this also has three inserts. This is designed to feed basically 25 men. Um, and they're just, they're, I love these things. These are great. But it's a lot lighter. Of course, everyone knows they have their. Uh, this is the model 1910 meat can. It's never called a mess kit. It's called a meat can up through 1962 and it was redesignated the meat pan. Um, but this is the original World War II design. You have the M1942 with the split on there, the pencils. Uh, World War I and World War II, you had your little leather things that would fit in your, your haversack, your backpack. Um, that just got redesignated the meat pan. This is a Vietnam era one. Basically the same thing. It's an ingenious design. You could, you know, supposedly cook in it too. That's why it was issued. <clears throat> now the only thing that guys get um, in the field if they had to do any cooking on their own is, is a, the flameless ration heater that comes in your MRE or your canteen cup. But how many guys you see wearing canteens in Afghanistan or Iraq, they're all wearing those Camel. camelbacks, which <laughs> leak. They're horrible. And you can't cook it. Always have a canteen cup and a spoon. Always, uh, if you're gonna eat. Now, again, here's the, the food tray galley. I don't have the trays. Again, this is what they have in the Army Air Force. Uh, your coffee and water was brought up to the front lines in a water can. This is not a gas can. It has a different opening. Um, after World War II, they, they went to a flatter lid, but it's basically the same thing. This is a 43-day one. <coughs> and, of course, if you're an officer, you ate out of the M1937 officer's mess chest. It has settings for eight people. Um, you usually wouldn't see this at a company level. This would be at battalion or regiment. They'd have these. Um, this is a pre-war one. Um, everything in here is original in World War II, except for I didn't get the coffee pot in it. This coffee pot came from an M1937 officer's mess chest that was made in, I think, 1987. They were still making these in the late 80s. I have another one of these at home. The box, the hardware is a little bit different, but it's the exact same thing. But they no longer exist, but they made them for years. This was made by Nash. But you also find some of the more recent ones made by SMP, State Machine Products, Kentucky State Prison. <laughs> but you know, they had all your utensils, they had a platter, your coffee cup. They're, they're pretty nifty. Now, up in the front lines, again, you know, your company officers in World War II and Korea were not eating off of this. You'd be at the town 
regimen, things like so that. So that kind of covers pretty much all the operational rations that we've used in the last 100 years. Um, anybody got any questions? Because I can keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I was told uh, the German troops were uh, supplied with vitamin pills, like we take a <coughs> Yeah. On your front lines. I, I've heard that? that. I've never seen any documentation. You've heard that before? I've heard it, but I've never seen any documentation on the German mm -hmm. rations. Okay. They got a lot less food than we did. We, again, were getting, on average, whether you ain't in the mess hall or in the field, you're getting, at a minimum, about 3,600 calories a day. Uh, the British were getting about 25 to 3,000 calories a day. 2,500 to 3,000. The Germans were lucky to get about 2,000 calories a day. Okay. And the Russians had a lot less. A lot less. Just an aside, I've heard a couple of things where you talk about the German troops in the battle of France and the Russian front. They were getting the type of better. Depends on the unit, though. Huh? That was, depends on what unit they were in. We issued amphetamines too. Well, but it was widespread during the Battle of uh, France. In the, the beginning of the war. Yeah. yeah. Put them right in front too. Yeah. How are you going to keep them awake? <laughs> they were going nonstop. Right. Just like we had standard issue for pilots in World War II were the amphetamines. You give, you give it, uh, one, one thing I read that says the, uh, you know, Lieutenant of Brady, I gave him a men were dragging, go through the snow, and he issued it out to everybody. 100%. Yeah. But it's not standard issue. That wasn't standard ration. Those are like augmentation things. I believe it was in. Hmm? I believe it was in. It, yeah, but being issued doesn't mean it was standard issue. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? I understand what you're yeah. saying, but from what I read, it sounds like they were, they were standard. I mean, if you needed them, you needed them. When did the, the concept of uh, prepackaged rations start? Uh, um, Napoleon got the credit for the canning process, but it was actually developed by a Frenchman before that competition even started. A gentleman named Aper, Apert, A P E R T, developed canning mm -hmm. before Napoleon announced, "Look, at, we want to come up with something that will keep rations fresh for the army." Um, that's the the original concept was canned stuff. Was uh, seventeen eighty something. That was when the idea first came about. Uh, in the American Civil War, they had canned pork and beans. Vandy canned pork and beans came out during the Civil War. They weren't issued. You could buy them at a sutler. Uh, they had canned condensed milk. They, the only thing that was like, we would consider a modern thing would be the, what they call desiccated vegetables in the Civil War, which are dehydrated vegetables. That was an issue item. Um, by the Spanish-American War, they were already issuing canned tomatoes, canned corned beef, canned roast beef, uh, canned corn, things like that, which we would know now as a B ration. Now, is it true that the, the can came out way before the can opener? But the original cans were glass. That's why when you get a mason jar, it's called canning. Can does not mean a metal can. That's why they're called tin cans as opposed to a regular can. They were they were glass. Yeah, but they no, they didn't have a can opener initially, like the the British Navy at the Franklin expedition. There was no issue can opener for those. They used a knife or a cleaver to open them up. Huh. Well, that's what the man is for. The what? That's what the man is for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, two questions. Um, didn't some of the first canning they were starting to use yet uh, lead to seal them? And they had a problem with that? Yeah, the, the, the original canning, yeah, like the Franklin Expedition. When they found the guys on Beachy Island and things, they saw a high lead content in their systems, and they thought that, you know, it was from the canning process. And it was. But it wasn't, all cans back then had lead. The problem was with the stuff that they bought for that expedition, they rushed the order, and it didn't overlap the cans like this, and the lead down in the center, and so it wasn't leaching through. They just rushed it so there's globs of lead on the inside of those cans and yeah it did affect their brains mm -hmm. same thing kind of happened in the um spanish-american war they had the armor scandal 
Um, it wasn't that the, the cans were processed wrong. There's nothing wrong with how they sealed those cans of beef that were down in Cuba. The problem was is they set them on the beach in Cuba. And what do you think about when you think of Cuba? Hot temperatures. Yeah. They sat there and sat there and That's sat good. there. And they're heating up the meat on the inside. They started expanding. That split the cans. <clears throat> it was not Armour's fault. It was the Army's fault for how they stored them. And the other thing <coughs> is, it, it is, it's hard for me to fathom that they use gasoline in them things without blowing themselves up. Oh, I have a few guys in the army that blew themselves up all the time. I met a cook that was on Guam, and he admitted he's in a wheelchair. He's at Connie at D-Day last or two, right, years, two years ago, and and he, I'm showing my burning unit. He goes, "Yeah, burnt down my tent with that." So, and so I, I look at him and go, "I've never had a problem with mine." Okay. But I was a boiler tech in the Navy. Okay. So, so lighting a little fire unit off to me is like I love it. So there were accidents. Oh God, yes, leave. constantly. Oh, same with the the, uh, the immersion heaters. Yeah. yeah. How's those eyes off? <laughs> they grew back. He had he had an immersion heater. It it it, get, it flamed it out and it, it, then all of a sudden it relit. Spontaneous combustion of the gas in there and come came right up the tube. I mean he wasn't you weren't right over it. I, mean, I was pretty like, much right over it. <laughs> just just that gas just came up. But yeah, that happened quite often. Okay, because I was gas so we come back. No, they were deadly. They, that, they even, I think I read them, they've killed people. Yeah, they have. Okay. See, those cabinets, if you don't, now if you get a flame out on that, what you need to do is you got to secure your flame valve. Or, no, you secure your fuel valve. Okay. Leave the flame valve open because that's going to let the gas leach out. You pull your burn it out of the cabinet, open up the gate, and open up the lid, and you let that air out for 20 minutes before you try to secure everything, repressurize and light off again and do it again because you want to make sure all that vaporized gas is gone. What you get is guys go, oh, a flame got, I'll go in here and relight it. And they go in with the match to relight the thing and boom. Yeah. And with the immersion, with the immersion heaters, the earlier 41s, 43. the 43s, the the three three. Yeah. were very notoriously known for blowing. <coughs> but the later ones almost became somewhat idiot proof. <laughs> you can still, you can still yeah, the, was. the original immersion heaters actually had a torch you had to send down to the bottom to light off a draft burner. Whereas the M67s, uh, you just opened a little spigot and lit it, <laughs> and it just dripped down. Okay. Essentially, is how those work. But they're just amazing. Like I said, uh, Bill Monday and I were talking to that guy that was in the Soviet Army, and he was absolutely amazed that we had K rations and C rations. We, we don't even have that now. The Russian Army now does. They have variations of MREs. Everybody does now. Every, everyone's copied that technology. But I, I remember hearing, like, uh, they would take prisoners from, you know, like, like even Russian or they there looking for food. Most of them were starving. <coughs> yeah, the Russian, Russian armies, uh, their, their phrase is, uh, she ikasha pisha nasha, which I told that guy's, that Russian guy's dad, and he started chuckling. And I think he was surprised I knew what it meant. It means, uh, she and kasha, that's our fare. Cabbage soup and, and, and basically oatmeal. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. And they got uh, 10 grams of fat a day. That's like wow. two, two pats of butter all day. Wow. So in the 50s, they'd actually take what was left over after the cooks made their meal. They'd take their little bit of butter and put it on their issue bread. They'd hold it up to the sun and see if they could get a reflection and make sure there's butter on it. <laughs> he was amazed that they had three different, you know, we were showing the K-Rats, we thought that was just one meal for the day. Yeah. So we told them all that there was a breakfast, a lunch, and a, and a dinner, and they got that every day. He was just flabbergasted that they had that 70 years ago. And then we showed them the field range that they got, you know, hot cooked meals of these ones a day. He couldn't believe that they had that 70 years ago. I'm going back to the Franklin expedition for a moment. Yeah. You say the cans were <coughs> Yeah, when you just poke the lid in around the top. No, they're not. You know, Cans aren't joined like this, okay? They're, they have an overlap, and normally in that overlap, they're like this, so they hook like that. And so the lead, they're in a rush, so the, they didn't do a good close crimp on that seam, 
right? It's kind of like a weld almost. Um, it just leached out into the cans. That's because the cans are still sitting there. I mean, it's like you go down to Columbus, New Mexico, there's all kinds of World War One ration cans laid out in the desert. <laughs> Down like in the Columbus, New Mexico, is the, the temperatures, you know, up there it's very cold, down there it's, it's very warm. It's, things are still there. You can you can examine them. Every once in a while, maybe on public television will do a documentary on the Franklin expedition. Yeah. Uh, Post more comes on the bodies. And yeah. Well, they have three bodies of the guys of three of the men that were there that <coughs> earlier on. Yeah. Probably the great the mark. Yeah. Yeah, they're on Beachy Island. Petty Officer Torrington is the only one I can remember by name. And his great, great, great grandnephew was the photographer on that expedition. And they're quite sure they found the record of Franklin, too. They believe so, yes, in Hudson Bay. Yeah. Of course, they got to get divers down to it, but it's still pretty fascinating. <clears throat> if you want, you come up and take a look at some stuff. I just, you know, if you want to touch it, please ask first. But feel Great free. presentation. Well, thank thank you. You. Okay. And I'm not cooking anything.